you didn't know it, but we had a cheating clock up there to help the speakers know when their time is done. But Gary's going to go for two or three hours here anyway, so he won't, he won't need that clock. <laughs> Some of us are better obeying that clock than others. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Ready? Okay. Five, four. <laughs> Oh my, you don't even sound tired at all. We want to welcome all of those that have tuned in and are watching. We are at the International Prophecy Conference. You may be seated. Thank you. We're still excited about uh, the prophetic days in which we live and the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I am Pastor. Pastor Joe Vancouvering, and we're in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida, and we welcome all of those that might be watching us around the world uh, this particular uh, afternoon, and uh, we're excited to have our speaker this afternoon with us. I think Gary's doing that over there, so I better get him up here right away. That's his way of telling me, sit down, I got to preach. Welcome uh, Gary Ka. Gary is a former Europe and Middle East uh, trade specialist for Indiana government. And uh, during the time that he held that position, he traveled extensively overseas, working closely with the economic staff at American embassies on trade-related projects. And during that time, he learned of efforts underway to establish a one-world political financial system. He also discovered there was a religious motivation connected with those developments. Gary has written two best-selling books detailing his experiences and explaining the goals of the One World Interfaith Movement, his books En Route to Global Occupation and The New World Religion are fully documented and are critical in understanding today's global developments, including the current financial crisis. Gary keeps interested readers informed of the latest international economic, political, and religious developments through his research news journal entitled Hope for the World Update. Gary is often on radio, television, talk shows, and uh, Christian audiences throughout the United States as well as internationally. I've known this man for almost 20 years. He and his beautiful wife, Audrey, have watched his kids grow up. We have been good friends and colleagues for a long, long time. I trust this man. I love this man. I trust the information that he gives. And some of the information that he gives is, is somewhat controversial to some, but he always gives it with a heart of integrity and a heart that's true to the, the Bible and, and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I count him a great friend. I'm so honored that he was able to make it this year. Welcome one more time to the International Prophecy Conference, my dear friend Gary Ka. Thank you, Joe. Are we all okay on the mic? I'm getting a little bit of feedback up here, so I'm going to give you a chance to adjust that. There we go. All right. Well, it has been uh, a very quick three days, hasn't it? Um, we always look forward to being here and um, uh, learning from each other, renewing old friendships opening the word together, uh, informing each other, but it goes quickly. And um, Audrey and I, unfortunately, are going to have to head out about an hour or so after I'm done speaking because we have to drive back to Indiana. We have to be back by sometime tomorrow, so we still have quite a ways to drive today. But we will be around for another hour or two afterwards. And so I look forward to, I know several of you still wanted to uh, share some things with me, so I will be here for a while afterwards. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, and while you're opening your Bibles to that chapter, I just want to mention one last time, uh, especially for the sake of people watching by television, if you would like to get hold of some of this information, the documentation for it, um, you can go to our website, garycaw.com. 
garyk.org. That's G-A-R-Y-K-A-H dot O-R-G. And there you can get information on our materials, uh, read some of our back articles, and also um, uh, subscribe to our newsletter that we put out. It's about a 20-page research journal. It's really not a newsletter. I don't know why we call it that. It's more of a research journal. And we do bend over backwards to document everything that we say in the newsletter, in the news journal, and we encourage you to get the message out and help to spread it. That's why we do it. We put a lot of work into it. We want to wake up uh, Christians and hopefully get non-Christians to think about the days we're living in and help lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our, our number one goal. All right, Matthew 24. I'm going to begin reading verse 32, and I'll be going on down to verse 39. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its, fig, as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now what Jesus was telling his disciples here and prophesying ahead to us is that we need to understand the signs of the times so that we can be ready as that time approaches. And there's a reason for that because this is to have a purifying effect on our lives. If you believe the Lord's coming soon, you're going to make adjustments in your life to bring your life into line with what God's will is, what you are to do for him and with him as he works through you through the power of his Holy Spirit. As we approach the second coming of Christ, we are to be ever-increasing lights in this dark world as the world is getting darker and darker. In fact, in Philippians 2.15, it tells us to become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are to be shining lights for the Lord Jesus Christ in these last days, as never before. Now, the reason I open up with these passages and saying this is, this afternoon, we're going to look at a number of different organizations, developments, individuals, some things will be exposed, and I don't take this lightly. And I don't want us to get into the mindset where we're just relishing the opportunity to expose other people and shed light on, on, on what they're doing without reflecting upon ourselves all along the way. We need to make sure we're living righteously before the Lord. And so self-examination ought to be a big part of this. So I wanted to say that up front. Um, I've been hesitant over the last year or two to share some of these things because I don't want to come across as if I'm bashing anyone, but there are things going on today, even in some Christian circles, that we simply have to be aware of in order to be discerning. And, and so I hope you, you understand why I am speaking on the subject that I'm speaking on this afternoon. Let's begin by going to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, you are so good to us. You're so merciful and gracious, even though we don't deserve it. And we just want to have pure hearts before you, Lord. And, and as we look at these things this afternoon, I just ask that you would give all of us discernment and understanding and help us to see how these things tie together and, and why we need to be aware of them and and who, sh who we should talk to about these things, because ultimately, Lord, you just want us to know the truth so that we can be more effective for you. 
we thank you for this time together. And Lord, that you have chosen to continue to give us the freedoms to this point that we can talk about these things. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this afternoon we're going to focus on President Obama, the Middle East, interfaithism, and the Vatican. Nothing controversial. <laughs> um, <laughs> but these are the developments that I thought you needed to be aware of um, the most here at the conference as, as we began honing in on, on uh, what I was going to share. And again, this is just the tip of the iceberg, what I will be sharing, but I'm going to highlight some of the key developments. And I may have to rely on my glasses here. I'm right at that stage. See, since we turned 50 this year, about half the time I have to use these and half the time I don't, and I never know what day it's going to be. So I'm going to keep them here handy just in case. You know what? It's not taking me long. I can't see the fine print anymore. There we go. All right. Much better. Jan Markell called these my grandpa glasses, so I guess that's, I'm not a grandpa yet though, but. On May 18th of last year, during an intense two-hour session with Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu in Washington, President Obama made clear that he is determined to see the implementation of a two-state solution and a complete halt to Jewish settlements in the West Bank. According to the news source, Jerusalem Newswire, a few days before this important meeting, White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel warned that the two-state solution remains, quote, the only solution, and that Israel had arrived at, quote, its moment of truth. This is from Rahm Emanuel. Obama is clearly using the stick and carrot approach with Benjamin Netanyahu. If Netanyahu wants to see the Iranian nuclear threat effectively confronted by the U.S., he must ensure progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front. Obama has a special contact that he may be using with Iran to get Iran to either back off or apply more pressure on Israel depending on whether Israel gives Obama the concessions he wants. Have any of you ever heard of a man by the name of Raila Odinga? Can I see a show of hands? I'm curious. Maybe two or three percent of you. Th this is so unbelievable that you can't write a movie script for what I'm about to share with you, but it, it's true. Raila Odinga is arguably the most powerful Islamic political figure in Kenya. He is the head of a group of influential and radical Muslim leaders in that country. He is not a good man. This man is extremely radical. Odinga ran for president of Kenya a couple of years ago. Do you remember the elections were held around Christmas time? Do you remember the bloodshed? Some of this was covered in our, uh, through our mass media. What happened was he lost the election and as a result, his thugs went out and began turning Kenya upside down. Close to a hundred, I mean close to a thousand Christians were murdered. Eight hundred churches were destroyed or burned to the ground. But not one single mosque was destroyed, which showed where this was coming from. This wasn't Christians. This was, these were radical Muslims under the influence of Raila Odinga. It caused so much commotion in Kenya that finally the government of Kenya had to allow Odinga to come on board to rule jointly with them. He is now in a key position of power in Kenya and is arguably the most powerful figure in Kenya as a result of, of what transpired. WorldNet Daily reported that Odinga, prior to the 2007 election, concluded a written agreement with Muslim leaders stipulating that if they delivered him the Muslim vote in Kenya, he would in turn, once elected, changed the constitution of that country to declare Islamic law as the ruling authority. And he's moving in that direction right now. But it becomes much more interesting than that. Barack Obama, through one of his organizations, with a donation of nearly $1 million, 
along with one of the sons of Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi, were among the biggest contributors to Odinga's 2007 presidential campaign. Now you say, how do you know that? Well, I can document it. Uh, some of you are familiar with the writings of Jerome Corsi with World Net Daily. That man deserves a special medal. It's amazing how brave he has been in uncovering some of these things. He actually traveled to Kenya to verify these kinds of details concerning what is really going on there and was fortunate to get out with his life. In fact, he was detained right before he was getting ready to hold a press conference to announce his findings. Men showed up with machine guns, held him for a day, and finally escorted him to an airplane and said some very nasty things to him before seeing him off on the plane. But Jerome Corsi obtained an internal document uh, from Kenya that revealed the exact amounts of money given to Odinga's campaign and where the money came from. This memo was prepared by the head of Odinga's campaign finance accounting section, Shaquille Shabir, as an official report delivered to the national treasurer for Odinga's Orange Democratic Movement Party, also known as ODM, Orange Democratic Movement. Among the 72 individuals and organizations that contributed money to Odinga's 2007 presidential run in Kenya, Shabir lists the organization Friends of Senator Barack Obama as having donated 66 million Kenyan shillings, which is about $950,000. So there's a financial connection here. That's right, our current president a little bit over two years ago, helped, helped to fund the campaign of this radical Muslim figure in Kenya who is now in power there. But it gets worse. Raila Odinga is Barack Obama's cousin. I can actually document this about five different ways, two of them through missionaries in Kenya, but I'm not going to name their names in front of everybody and subject them to the possible persecution that could result. But I think uh, this source will suffice. It's British Broadcasting Corporation, dated October 15th of 2008. They did a blurb, a little article, it says, Odinga says Obama is his cousin. And the article states, Mr. Odinga told the BBC's The World Today that Senator Obama's father was his maternal uncle. The Kenyan leader made the statement in an interview in which he discussed foreign interest in the political turmoil in his country. He said Mr. Obama had on Monday taken time out of campaigning for the New Hampshire primary to call him twice to express his concern and to say that he would also be calling Mr. Kibaki, his opponent. It's BBC News a few weeks before the election over here. It's so right up until the time that the election was taking place in the United States. Obama was in touch with his cousin in Kenya, checking in with him on a regular basis. On February 25th of 2009, Ahmadinejad of Iran made a trip to Kenya in which he held a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Odinga at the Laiko Regency Hotel in Nairobi. So we know that those two men have been in touch. And then they met again. In a May 28th trip to Tehran, Odinga met with Ahmadinejad to agree to the establishment of, and I'm quoting, of special working groups to advance the implementation of signed memoranda of understanding on a wide range of issues, including trade, banking, agriculture, oil and education, according to a joint communique issued at the end of the meeting. So Kenya is being drawn in to the radical Muslim scene more and more because of Odinga, and Odinga is in regular contact with Ahmadinejad of Iran. And you say, what does all this mean? Well, if you th put the pieces together, our president, whose cousin is Odinga, meeting with Ahmadinejad, Obama can communicate through Odinga to Ahmadinejad and have him apply more pressure on Israel or less pressure on Israel depending on what Obama 
what concessions he gets from Israel. This is entirely possible. There's got to be a reason why Obama wanted his cousin in power so bad in Kenya that he was willing to uh, funnel $950,000 in his direction. In late June, early July of last year, within a few days of each other, Barack Obama, the Pope, and Tony Blair each called for a two-state solution in Israel using almost identical language, all within a few days of each other. That was not a coincidence. I believe that was coordinated. They came out at the, almost the exact same time with the same wording. All three of these men are working in cahoots on the Palestinian-Israeli crisis. Their efforts are being coordinated largely through the Vatican. In fact, Tony Blair has made regular trips to the Vatican. Actually, after he stepped down as Britain's Prime Minister, he converted to Roman Catholicism. Uh, probably most of you are aware of that by now. And then within uh, months of that, he began traveling regularly to the Vatican on his way to Israel, being involved in negotiations for Mideast peace. We also know that Palestinian leaders have gone to Rome on several occasions to meet with Vatican officials. And some Israeli leaders have also made trips there. Barack Obama has been to meet with the Pope, and Hillary Clinton has been there all during the last year. So much of this is going through Rome. I think we would be astonished to know how much of the Mideast peace negotiations are being moved along behind the scenes through decisions being made in Rome. And Barack Obama is very much, I believe, involved in this for a number of reasons, and some of this will become more clear as we move on. Now, you might say, what is the ultimate goal of these meetings? I believe the number one goal of these individuals is to internationalize Jerusalem. They want to take Jerusalem away from being under the sovereign control of the Israelis, and they want to, want to put it under the control of an international organization, either uh, the United Nations or an empowered European Union, the way things are, are shaping up. Secondly, they would like to unite Islam, Judaism, and Christianity and make Jerusalem the interfaith religious capital of the world. They want to see these religions brought together. Why? If there's going to be a global government down the world, somehow these religions have to be united at least to a degree to make that possible. So there's a strong religious element to all of this. Those efforts will then lead, I believe, to the rebuilding of the temple. The question is, who will be worshipped in this rebuilt temple? Many of you are familiar with uh, David Brickner, executive director of Jews for Jesus. He wrote an excellent article last August, August 15th. It's called Rebuilding the Temple Revisited. And I just want to share a few quotes with you. He begins the article with the following scenario. The request reads, Children wanted for future temple service. Ultra-Orthodox Jewish sect is searching for parents willing to hand over newborn sons to be raised in isolation and purity in preparation for the rebuilding of the biblical temple in Jerusalem. Only members of the Jewish priestly caste, the Kohanim, need apply. End quote. Brickner continues, Words from an ancient scroll discovered in a recent archaeological dig, or perhaps an excerpt from a Hollywood screenplay for some biblical epic? Actually, those words appeared in the contemporary Israeli newspaper, Haaretz. Brickner continues, Is there a rebuilt temple in Israel's future? The Hebrew scriptures in the New Testament both refer to that temple and to tragic events that will occur there in the last days. First the prophet Daniel, and then Jesus, referring to Daniel's prophecy, warned people about the abomination that causes desolation standing in the holy place. Daniel 9, 27, Matthew 24, 15, as well as some other passages. Daniel predicts a terrible time of tribulation beginning with the peace treaty signed between Israel and the Antichrist. Perhaps the treaty will actually clear the way for the rebuilding of the temple. 
Anyone who could facilitate such momentous accomplishment would be sure to win the respect and trust of many Jewish people worldwide. But whatever respect and trust the treaty engenders will soon be betrayed. This betrayal will be manifested in such an insidious manner that Daniel can only describe it as the abomination. The fact that nearly two-thirds of today's Israeli Jews hope to see the temple rebuilt should give us pause, should cause us to be circumspect about the times we are living in. Those who understand this teaching of Scripture will temper their eagerness to see the temple rebuilt with the realization that it will one day set the stage for Israel's darkest hour. But the saying holds true, it is darkest just before dawn. And of course right there, Brickner is referring to the second coming of Christ. But between now and then, the rebuilt temple, the way things are shaping up, there's going to be much more to it the way it's presented than maybe what we've been aware of. So I'm going to continue on here. I was absolutely shocked by some of these um, findings I'm, I'm going to share with you. This following article discusses a scenario under which the temple could be rebuilt. This article actually appeared in World Net Daily on August 5th of last year. It's titled, What? Muslim leader wants temple rebuilt? It says, the idea of rebuilding the Jerusalem temple on a foundation occupied and administered by Islamic militants might seem fanciful, even preposterous. But the author of a new book returned from Turkey recently with news that a prominent Islamic teacher and best-selling author and Jewish Sanhedrin rabbis are conspiring to do just that. Author Joel Richardson reveals the historically unprecedented development. Now this is Joel Richardson speaking, sharing his experience. He writes, Adnan Oktar, spelled O-K-T-A-R, who uses the pen name of Harun Yahya, is a controversial but highly influential Muslim intellectual and author with more than 65 million of his books in circulation worldwide. I believe he's the number one best-selling Muslim. I'm not positive, but I believe he is. Oktar recently met with three representatives from the reestablished Jewish Sanhedrin, a group of 71 Orthodox rabbis and scholars from Israel, to discuss how religious Muslims, Jews, and Christians can work together on the project. These three from the Jewish Sanhedrin met with the Muslim leader Adnan Oktar in Istanbul, Turkey. The objectives of the alliance include waging a joint intellectual and spiritual battle against the worldwide growing tide of irreligiousness, unbelief, and immorality, explains Richardson, who also met in Turkey with Oktar to interview him. But even more unusual is their agreement with regard to the need to rebuild the Jewish temple, a structure that Mr. Oktar, a Muslim, refers to as the Majid, or mosque, or the Palace of Solomon. An official statement about the meeting has been published on the Sanhedrin's website. Concluding the statement is the following call. This is a rather lengthy quote. But this has been posted on the website of the Sanhedrin, in their own words. Listen to this. Out of a sense of collective responsibility for world peace and for all humanity, we have found it timely to call to the world and exclaim, and exclaim that there is a way out for all peoples. It is etched in a call to all humanity. We are all the sons of one father, the descendants of Adam, and all humanity is but a single family. Peace among nations will be achieved through building the house of God, where all peoples will serve as foreseen by King Solomon in his prayers at the dedication of the first holy temple. Come, let us love and respect one another, and love and honor and hold our Heavenly Father in awe. Let us establish a house of prayer in his name in order to worship and serve him together for the sake of his great compassion. He surely does not want the blood of his creation spilled but prefers love and peace among all mankind. We pray to the Almighty Creator that you hearken to our call. Together, each according to his or her ability, we shall work towards the building of a house of prayer for all nations on the Temple Mount in peace and mutual understanding." End quote. 
Oktar explained his vision then for the rebuilding of Solomon's temple in his interview to Richardson. This is Oktar now, a Muslim speaking. And I quote him, he says, the palace of Solomon is a historically important palace and rebuilding it would be a very wonderful thing. It is something that any Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim should welcome with enthusiasm. Every Muslim, every believer will want to return to those days, to experience those days again, and albeit partially, to bring the beauty of those days back to life. Oktar added that the Temple of Solomon, quote, will be rebuilt and all believers will worship there in tranquility, end quote. During his meeting with the Sanhedrin rabbis, Oktar expressed his belief that the temple could be rebuilt in one year from the time it's begun. I quote him, it could be done in a year at most. It could be built to the same perfection and beauty. The Torah says it was built in 13 years, if I remember correctly. It could be rebuilt in a year in its perfect form. Now, this is pretty mind-boggling because this is the, the best-selling Islamic author in the world pushing for this, but from an interfaith standpoint. You understand, they, they want to present this temple as a type of interfaith house of worship where people from all the world's different religions can come together there. This is not the only similar call to rebuild the Jewish temple, points out Richardson. Yoav Frankel is an Orthodox Jew who has been deeply involved in interfaith dialogue with Muslims and also envisions a shared temple mount. Also, the Interfaith Encounter Association is working on a project called God's Holy Mountain. It sees the day when the rebuilt Jewish temple will exist side by side with the Dome of the Rock. Richardson sees such plans tying into Barack Obama's calls for internationalizing the city of Jerusalem. See, all these developments are going on at the same time. Very powerful forces uh, that our, our own president is part of are pushing for the internationalization of Jerusalem at the same time that behind the scenes you've got religious leaders from Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, as we'll see, coming together pushing for this development. But I believe it's interfaithism. You understand what I mean by interfaithism, right? Some of you who are new to this, we're talking about the idea that all religions are pathways to God that there's, there's more than one way. It's not just through Jesus Christ, but it's through multiple ways that you can uh, achieve um, uh, salvation or uh, uh, live forever in eternity. Now, I've shared a little bit about some of the developments taking place among a few of the Sanhedrin members and some Islamic leaders. But you might wonder, I haven't heard anything yet about about Christians. Somehow, Christianity has, been, has to be brought into the mix on this as well in order for it to work. And I wish I didn't have to share this following part, but I'm, I'm doing it as, as humbly as I possibly can, and I am not wanting to speak about any of these individuals in a condescending manner, and I hope you understand that. But I found out last June that the Islamic Society of North America, which happens to be headquartered just 40 miles from our house in Plainfield, Indiana, was going to be holding its annual convention, which is the largest annual gathering of Muslims on the continent, in Washington, D.C. over the 4th of July weekend. And as part of this gathering in Washington, D.C., they invited Rick Warren to be their keynote speaker. And Rick accepted the invitation and he spoke to this group. And this is a pretty radical group if you follow the trail and their affiliations. Joining Warren for the session was the Islamic Society of North America's president, Ingrid Matson, and noted Muslim scholar Hamza Yusuf, spelled Y-U-S-U-F. Now, if, if Rick had gone to share with these people the love of Christ, he might have been taking his life into his own hands. I don't know, he might have been stoned. But I believe the only way that the Apostle Paul 
would have done something like this. And I think he, he would have if he would have been able to present the gospel. And he would have done so in as loving of a way pos- as possible. And he might have had to pay some consequences as a result. That's the only way I can justify going to this type of meeting. Because if you're not going for that purpose, then you're only helping to lend credibility to this organization and giving it visibility among Christians, especially if you're an individual who has millions of followers behind you in America and around the world. So this is very troubling. Then I found out that uh, Rick Warren also became a member of the board of directors of Tony Blair's Faith Foundation. Now if you're not aware of this, Tony Blair, uh, after stepping down from being Britain's Prime Minister and after converting to Catholicism, he started a faith foundation whose stated purpose is to unite the world's religions. He even taught a course on this at Yale University just last year. He is very much into this, bringing the religions of the world together because he believes that's the only way that the Mideast peace can be achieved. And so now Rick Warren is on his board along with a Muslim cleric and people of other religions. Again, I have a serious problem with that. I think you should as well uh, because we're looking at interfaithism here. Uh, Rick Warren is lending credibility to this uniting of the world's religions. Whether he believes Jesus is the only way or not, the appearance it's giving is that it's all right to come together with all the world's religions and have unity in that sense. I did write uh, Rick Warren a letter a few years ago when I first uh, found out that he was becoming involved in certain organizations that I was very concerned about before I even learned any of this. And I wrote the letter very carefully over a period of a couple of days, very prayerfully. And then I sat on it for a while, just wanting to have an absolute peace before I sent it on. And until I was certain that everything was written the way the Lord wanted me to write it, I I didn't send it. Um, But I shared in there about my own political background, how I had worked uh, in the government of of Indiana, and how in, in 1995, I believe I shared this part, about how I was actually asked by a candidate running for governor in Indiana to be his running mate, to run as lieutenant governor. In other words, anything I could to lend some credibility that he might listen and that he might first of all receive this letter, that it might get through to him and that he might then uh, look at what I write and take it seriously. And I didn't write it in a judgmental way, it was written in a spirit of love. And I just said, look, when I was in politics, here are some of the things I learned about a few of these organizations. Uh, some of which I was invited to join. And this agenda that is, is, is driving these organizations, and I just urged them to be very careful about his associations and joining these organizations. I never heard back from him. I do believe the letter got through. I really do. But I never heard back from him, and since that time he has joined more organizations and become involved in this type of thing, these developments, uh, really up to his eyeballs. Now. I realize his wife has cancer. He's fearing, uh, facing a, a very difficult time right now, and I think we should pray for Rick Warren as well as his wife and, and not simply shun him uh, because God can turn him around. But right now, he is in the wrong. And if I could tell you all the people I've met that are moving in the same direction now because of what they see Rick Warren doing because of their respect for him, this is doing incredible damage within Christian circles. And so on the one hand, I'm upset with him. On the other hand, um, uh, you know, I, I want to love him as a brother in the Lord and, and, and not be exceedingly judgmental. Along with uh, Rick's involvement in this evolving scene, back in June, we discovered that Pastor Bill Hybels of Willow Creek Church in Chicago was planning to bring Tony Blair to his church to speak. I didn't want to just go by rumor or hearsay, so two weeks ago, um, I called Willow Creek, uh, spoke to a couple of their people, and asked them if Tony Blair had in fact spoken there, and it was confirmed that he did, uh, last August at their leadership summit. I was also told by the one lady who's very kind and helpful um, that he might be speaking at the upcoming leadership summit on August 5th and 6th of this year, but she didn't know yet for sure because the uh, list of speakers had not yet been finalized. But you can get that information eventually if you go to willowcreek.com and click on the leadership summit registration. Eventually they will post the list of speakers coming up for, for this year. 
But much of the, the interfaith focus that, that Tony Blair and others are pushing right now, it's currently going toward bringing Christians and Muslims together because this has been their biggest challenge is getting Christians and Muslims together to make everything work in the Middle East and elsewhere. Have any of you heard of the Chrislamic movement? Chrislamic movement, as in Christianity and Islam together? Yeah, I'm, I'm not joking. This is really coming on strong. If you haven't heard about it, you will over the next year. I can almost guarantee you. Chris, the Chrislamic movement. Unbelievable. Joel Richardson, who I just quoted a few minutes ago, on August 25th, wrote an article called Christians Celebrating Ramadan? Asking a question. He commented, there is a left-wing Christian sect in America often referred to as the emerging church. This year, a group of emergent Christians led by one of the United States' most influential pastors, Brian McLaren, has announced that it will actually be observing the Muslim Holy Month along with a Muslim partner. Now, this was last August, so it's talking about Ramadan coming up in just a few weeks from that time. He goes on to say, Ramadan is the month that Muslims thank Allah, their God, for revealing the Quran to Muhammad, their prophet. On McLaren's personal blog, he recently announced his intentions, I quote, we as Christians humbly seek, humbly seek to join Muslims in this observance of Ramadan as a God-honoring expression of peace, fellowship, and neighborliness, end quote. This is Brian McLaren. But does such an interreligious observance go beyond mere neighborliness and cross the line of religious compromise and syncretism? Does observing the religious holy month of Ramadan create the impression of an endorsement of Islam? Richardson believes it does, as do I, and I believe most of you would agree. McLaren, a leading voice in this movement, wants everyone to know that he has not converted to Islam but is a deeply committed Christian. But McLaren is not fasting for the salvation of his Muslim friends. Instead, he is seeking through the practice of this Islamic ritual to promote, quote, the common good together with people of other faith traditions, end quote. That's a huge step in the direction of interfaithism. Richardson continues, despite McLaren's well-articulated niceties, what is clearly missing among his five posts on his personal blog is a single mention of praying for Muslims to come to Christ. This stands in stark contrast to the 30 Days Prayer Network website where a loving but firm position is maintained. And those people have done an excellent job in reaching out to Muslims in a spirit of Christian love the way it ought to be done. While loving and befriending others is paramount to the Christian faith, the Bible is clear that Christians are to avoid actually participating in their religious ceremonies. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15 says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Yet, According to Joel Richardson, emergent pastor Tony Campolo has argued that such interfaith prayers and even mystical unions are critical for all true peacemakers. So whether it's Campolo, Hybels, Warren, Brian McLaren, there's a pattern here and a trend. These people are in fact moving toward a unification of the world's religions. And they've already dragged a good part of Christendom into all of this right behind them. And that's why we need to have conferences like this because people need to be aware of it. Evangelicals must be warned against interfaithism because it's a huge deception. Jesus stated in no uncertain terms in John 14, 6, that he is the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes unto the Father except through him. And that is stressed repeatedly 
throughout the Gospels. It's not just a one-time statement. In fact, in John alone, the same statement is made using slightly different wording about four or five different times. What concerns me is that today, unfortunately, there is a growing abundance of false unity out there. But at the same time, unfortunately, there's a lack of true unity, the kind that Jesus called for in John 17 in his high priestly prayer. So we've got the wrong kind of unity going gangbusters, and the kind of unity we need, there's a lack of. You know, so many times, Christians who are largely on the same page, they might differ a little bit here and there on some things, but they're bickering over some of the smallest things. And then over here, you've got some of the leaders of Christendom uniting with the leaders of other religions. So it, it's so important that we get our act together and swallow our pride. And there's, there's too much pride. I don't even want to go into that. But even among e Christian evangelical leaders, some of the things that we find out about sometimes in ministry that, that break our heart, um, there just needs to be some swallowing of pride and some humility shown in order for there to be true unity among Bible-believing Christians. Uh, we need to set an example and raise the standard and show the rest of the world what true unity is, especially at a time when false unity is, is running rampant. Pope John Paul II, back in 1986, publicly launched the interfaith movement. Many people are not aware of that. Some people ask me, wh when did this begin? Well, you could go way back, but really, when it began taking a strong foothold, it was in 1986. That year, the Pope organized an interfaith meeting in Assisi, Italy, just outside of Rome. He invited over 200 religious leaders from around the world, representing all the world's major religions. I have video footage of that meeting here. It's something you almost have to see to believe. And this is a, a videotape series that was put out a number of years ago. It's called um, John Paul II, Let There Be Peace, the Pope and Other Faiths. Actually, that's the, that's the name of, the, of this particular video, which is the fifth one in a nine-video series. Again, it's called Let There Be Peace, the Pope and Other Faiths. This is put out by a Catholic organization, so it wasn't put out to try to expose the Pope, but just to show what he is doing, and they're largely in agreement with that. And you see there, in Assisi, Italy, all these religious leaders, including the Dalai Lama, who is a close friend of, of the Pope's, the Dalai Lama being the symbolic leader of Buddhism, um, all sitting together, and uh, two different occult ceremonies are actually s shown taking place, one of them uh, being conducted by Native American Indians using a smudge pot, and unless you're familiar with occultism, you might not even realize what's taking place, but it's an occultic ceremony. And also on this video, uh, they show the Pope traveling to India and to Thailand and participating in, in Hindu and Buddhist ceremonies. Unless they use the most clever trick photography I've ever seen, um, this really happened, and, and you can see it on here. Also on this video, one of the Pope's top cardinals was quoted as saying that the Pope believed that the Holy Spirit is present in all people, whether they are a Christian or not. I could share much more. So this is when the interfaith movement began to go public. During the 90s, it gained momentum, and in the last five or six years, things are going very quickly now. You have to understand that the Vatican is where Eastern religion, Islam, and Christianity all come together. In my book, The New World Religion, in chapters 8 and 9, and also in the historical summary that follows those chapters, I explain the ties with Eastern religion. There are a lot of Christian principles in Roman Catholicism, but mixed in with it have been certain concepts from the Eastern religions that have come in over the years. It's, it's a, a hybrid, it's a mix. And many of you are already aware of that. I'm not telling you anything uh, new there. It's even in the symbolism of... of uh, the Catholic Church, some of the symbols that are used. However, you might say, what about Islam? Well, Islam holds Mary in very high regard. A lot of Christians are not aware of that. 
So there's a bit of a common denominator there. And Pope John Paul II understood that and used that to open up a lot of doors with the Muslims. Muhammad believed that when he would go to paradise, Mary would be his wife. Also, you're familiar with the, the visions, the apparitions that were allegedly seen in the early 1900s in Fatima, Portugal? There's significance to that as well because Fatima was the name of Muhammad's daughter. And so many Muslims believe that the fact that Mary appeared in Fatima is very significant. And there are other things as well. And so there have been discussions between Catholic leaders and Muslim leaders going on now uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. I told my wife maybe four or five years ago, I said, if Muslims around the world begin to claim that they are seeing apparitions of Mary as well, then we know the hour is getting very late. That began happening a couple of years ago. In Indonesia, in Egypt, and in some other places, Muslims claiming to have had visions of Mary speaking to them. Now it's interesting, many of the visions that are being seen around the world where people are traveling to have these experiences have to do with people rallying around the Pope and following his lead on different things he is pushing for, all to bring about world peace. So just keep, keep that in mind and be aware of that. I think we're going to see more and more of this in the days ahead. Well, the current Pope was actually a mentor of sorts to Pope John Paul II on, on issues of dogma. They were contemporaries, they're close to the same age. But a lot of people are not aware of the fact that the current pope actually helped to mentor the previous pope in the area of dogma. And that's why you have not seen a lot of change between the previous pope and, and this pope. They, they're moving in the same general direction. But the popes have also been very active in global politics. Shifting gears just a little bit here. On July 6th, Pope Benedict issued his Charity and Truth Statement, also known as an encyclical. This is a radical document that puts the Roman Catholic Church firmly on the side of an emerging world government, according to Cliff Kincaid of Accuracy and Media, who followed this very closely. I have some direct quotes from the Pope's encyclical. I just want to share a few excerpts the Pope said, in the face of the unrelenting growth of global interdependence, there is a strongly felt need, even in the midst of a global recession, for a reform of the United Nations organization, and likewise of economic institutions and international finance, so that the concept of the family of nations can acquire real teeth. Now, did you catch that? The concept of the family of nations so that it can acquire real teeth through economic reforms. Globalists have for years wanted a structure in place with real teeth, in other words, power, to be able to enforce these international principles. That's what's being talked about here. He goes on, he says, this seems necessary in order to arrive at a political, juridical, and economic order which can increase and give direction to international cooperation for the development of all peoples in solidarity. For all this, he says, there is urgent need of a true world political authority, end quote. It's basically calling for world government. A lot of other people call it a world political authority as well. The new world order, world government, it's all the same thing. This was from the Pope last summer. Benedict went on to say that such an authority would have to be regulated by law and would need to be universally recognized and to be vested with the effective power to ensure security for all. Obviously, it would have to have the authority to ensure compliance with its decisions from all parties and also with the coordinated measures adopted in various international forums, he said. In its coverage of the Pope's statement, Reuters News Service added the following. He said, the United Nations, economic institutions, and international finance all had to be reformed even in the midst of a global recession, the Pope said in the encyclical. An encyclical is the highest form of papal writing and gives the clearest indication to the world's 1.1 billion Catholics as well as non-Catholics of what the Pope and the Vatican think about specific social and moral issues. 
It was addressed to all Catholics as well as, quote, all people of goodwill, and was released on the eve of the start of the G8 summit in Italy, and three days before the Pope was due to discuss the global economic downturn with U.S. President Barack Obama. So the timing of these statements was not a coincidence. These were political statements intended to have a political impact. According to the Associated Press, President Obama sat down with Pope Benedict at the Vatican on July 10th for a meeting in which frank but constructive talks were held. It's a great honor, Obama said as he greeted the Pope, thanking him for this first meeting. They sat down at the pontiff's desk and exchanged pleasantries before reporters and f photographers were ushered out of the ornate room. The Pope was heard asking about the Group of Eight Summit, the meeting of developed nations that concluded before Obama's arrival at Vatican City. Obama said it was very productive. The Pope and Obama met for half an hour, then were joined by First Lady Michelle Obama. Upon leaving, Obama again thanked the Pope. We look forward to a very strong relationship between our two countries, he said. Obama speaking. Obama, I believe, realizes the importance of the Pope's role in behind-the-scenes Mideast politics and in pushing interfaithism and globalization. Even though Obama is pro-abortion and pro-homosexual, even going so far as declaring June as National Gay, Lesbian, and Transvestite Month in the United States, he and the Pope are working together on a number of fronts. They are in agreement on globalization, on a two-state solution for Israel, and on dividing Jerusalem, among other things. So where is all of this going? Well, I mentioned it earlier, uh, at least in part, they would like to internationalize Jerusalem, put it under international control. And the only way you can enforce that is by putting international troops there as well to make sure that this is not a sovereign city under the Jews and Israel, but that it is an international city. So that means at some point, either UN troops or European Union troops have to be brought in to enforce whatever agreement they come up with there that involves the internationalization of Jerusalem. Now once that occurs, then whoever sits on top of this bureaucracy, this hierarchy, can pretty much do whatever they want to do. You see where this is going. It's setting the stage for the Antichrist. And we're not that far away from this because a lot of this is moving quite rapidly. I want to share with you something that we printed in our uh, summer newsletter. We came across a very interesting press release posted on the Dow Jones and Company's Market Watch website dated December 12th of 2008. The article was titled, Share International Reveals Christmas Miracle. Share International is an occult New Age organization headquartered in California. The article again titled, Share International Reveals Christmas Miracle, and it advised readers to prepare for a miracle that everyone will see in the sky. Shortly before the emergence of Maitreya and his group, the Masters of Wisdom. Here are some excerpts. These are quotes. Look now for the biggest miracle of all. In the very near future, a large bright star will appear in the sky, visible to all throughout the world, night and day. Unbelievable? Fantasy? No, a simple fact. Around a week later, Maitreya, the world teacher for all humanity, will begin his open emergence, and, though not yet using the name Maitreya, will be interviewed on a major U.S. television program, end quote. Maitreya was described in the article as follows. Awaited by all faiths under different names, Maitreya is the Christ to Christians, the Imam Mahdi to Muslims, Krishna to Hindus, the Messiah to Jews, and Maitreya Buddha to Buddhists. He is the world teacher for all, religious or not, an educator in the broadest sense. End quote. 
Do you see how laying the groundwork of interfaithism is important to this agenda for it to succeed? They're literally seeing the Antichrist as being a uniter of the world's religions through a mass deception. Now, the only question I have is, was this press release describing the soon revealing of the Antichrist who may already be among us, or is this merely a clever decoy to keep us from identifying the real Antichrist when he emerges? I don't know. I can't answer that question. Only time will tell. But we need to stay in the word and keep watch. Because when you see articles being posted, being viewed by millions of people around the world along these lines, you know that the things are getting close. Turn with me back to Matthew chapter 24, the same chapter that we started out with. <clears throat> Matthew 24, beginning with verse 23. Jesus said, At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. Now you know a deception has to be huge, incredible, for it to succeed or to have the potential of succeeding among Christian believers. And that's why I believe no matter how the Antichrist comes to power and all the things leading up to that, there's going to be an element of deception that takes place in the name of Christ, but that will not be of Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, as well as 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, along with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation chapters 13 and 14, are just a few of the other passages that warn us of an unprecedented deception that will take place in the last days just prior to the return of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.14 warns us that Satan masquerades as an angel of light and his servants as servants of righteousness. So we shouldn't be surprised that even certain Christian leaders are being drawn into this and taking others with them who aren't discerning. But the prophet Daniel tells us that those who know their Lord will be strong and do great exploits. Daniel 12, 3 and 4. So all these things taking place, the fact that we're privy to this information and have it, it just takes a little bit of research. We can then use this to help open up people's eyes, help them to be better discerning, and even help lead non-Christians to saving knowledge of Christ. Because all of this is moving in the direction of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, proving the Bible to be true. Because we were warned about this 2,000 years ago, in some cases longer than that, and now we see it taking place before our very eyes. The Lord wants us to be wise and to be engaged in speaking his truth, which will result in leading many to righteousness, salvation in Christ. To please the Lord in these last days, we have to be discerning and persevering. We have to understand the truth and then persevere in it. The two go together. Toward that end, James 1.12 has become probably my favorite life verse. And Mark mentioned it earlier as well. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. The, you can go ahead and clap. That's, <laughs> but the emphasis here is on blessed will be the person who perseveres under trial, who perseveres in the truth for the sake of the Lord. I believe we are living at a time where this applies more than ever before. But I, I, I want you to be encouraged because we are not alone. Um, I've been sharing this similar message around the country, been in Scotland back in, in, in September, all over the place, and there is a remnant. There is a remnant all around the world. We're in a minority, but we're not alone. So we can draw comfort from the fact that there are others who are seeing what is going on as well and are doing their best to be discerning and 
to walk rightly before the Lord. What the Lord most wants from us in these last days, I believe, is that we live our lives as an offering for him. As we see these signs of the times coming, it should get our attention and bring us closer and closer to the Lord. By living our lives as an offering to him, that's how we worship the Lord and bring him the glory that he deserves. If we truly pursue the Lord and make him number one in our lives, we'll experience his peace, joy, and presence as we look forward to his return. So no matter how difficult times become between now and then, we will be able to stand firm and be overcomers through him. I leave you with Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Praise God. Thank you. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Awesome. Wasn't this tremendous? Great information. Great heart. It's right at the 4 o'clock hour. We're going to release you now. We will reconvene and start right on time. 7 o'clock tonight, the final night. Donald Perkins and Chuck Missler, go get a quick power nap. Rest a little, whatever you need to do, and uh, we'll see you back here in three hours. God bless.